want to welcome everyone back to the Picanino Show. Returning, Charles Haywood. How are you doing, Charles? I am pleased to be here and pleased to return. <laughs> Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Let's start off with the plugs and uh, so we can you know, not have to do that at the end. Once upon a time, I was born as a Gen Xer, the best generation in human history. And uh, I'm a relatively slightly older on the Gen Xer side, but I'm not a spiritual boomer. I'm pleased to report uh, that probably was, really wasn't what you were asking. Uh, in real life, I write at theworthyhouse.com, and I also write on Twitter sometimes at the Worthy House. Uh, I am a sometime recovering lawyer, sometime shampoo manufacturer, and now um, hobby farmer and troublemaker. <laughs> I listened to the latest one about the um, the last thirty days of the the Weimar Republic, and that's really interesting. That's I, I'm I have to start going through that book and um, leafing through and seeing some of those some of the reports. I think yes. it'd be very interesting. It, it, it was very interesting, and in the you know, as I said in my review of this book, the Grave Diggers. The one of the most interesting things was simply the newspaper headlines from yeah. the different kinds of newspapers. Yeah, I I can just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it, it hasn't changed. I was studying the um, the 1890 to 1905 1906 pogroms in in Russia recently, and when you look at the headlines and you look at the stories. I'm, you could basically, it's like October 7th. It, it, it's like all the stuff that you, you saw on Twitter that John Podoritz was like putting out <laughs> yeah. due to October 7th. The, the, the people have, yeah, it, but it is interesting because, it, again, I said this in the review, the divergence in headlines is, or in top level uh, statements of the stories, because obviously we get news other than from newspapers now, is less significant nowadays. That is, the narrative is more coherent. Whereas that back then, people would uh, one of the the newspapers in Berlin was published twice daily, like totally different. You got you got a widely divergent set of both articles and and news. Now you see that I think you're right in certain in certain things nowadays, like. October 7th. And I, I again, I'm not, not to repeat my review, but there is a kind of a crack in that, in the kind of left narrative coalition, particularly with respect to October 7th kind of stuff. But in general, the differences in the way news is presented to the average normie is, is not very, very significant now relative to the way it used to be in the past. Yeah. Well, I think there is uh, one of the differences is most, uh, so much news is filtered through Twitter. And when, you know, things like um, 40 dead and some beheaded babies uh, happens with Elon Musk. Elon Musk hasn't doesn't have a free speech site. I still know people who get banned from it for not for not like yeah. breaking the law, doing things to break the right. law. Um, but still, there are people there would be a time where if somebody came in and said, OK, show me the evidence. And you know, said I I, I want to see the evidence that that would be shut down. That 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 would be. Um, and now it's when you see people going, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, and it, that's like every <laughs> every comment, yeah. you know, half the comments, and no one's willing to show the evidence, or they're oh, why do you want to see that? It's like well, because we don't because I remember babies babies being thrown out incubators. <laughs> I, I remember babies on bayonets. <laughs> right. we're, we're, we're old enough. Well, I, I don't think we're old enough to remember babies on bayonets, but we're old enough to remember <laughs> babies on uh, babies on in, 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 being thrown out of incubators. And I mean, I made this point on uh, on Twitter, not that it's an original point, that it, the the fact that it appears that this treasonous immigration bill is dead is strictly due to Twitter. Twitter under Musk. That is, if it wasn't for Twitter under Musk, you know, it, the, any significant criticism would have been banned or people would have self-censored to a much more significant degree. So therefore, Senate Republicans wouldn't have felt the pressure and they just would have been able to force it through. I mean, it, it, it's actually amazing to me. They appear to have managed to kill it before it even left the Senate. <laughs> which is a real accomplishment. I, mean, I, thought, I assumed it would probably go down in the House and they would put a lot of effort into it. But that's if, if it weren't for Musk buying Twitter, the discourse would have been radically different on Twitter. Not because everybody would have been, uh, not because the topic itself would have been banned, but because the 
the form of discussion would have been largely self-censored and partially directly censored. And this has been true in repeated issues over the past year. So I, 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 while it is true that, that Twitter is not a free speech site, and we can get into that if you want, and that's down to largely Musk if, in the typical entrepreneurial fashion, saying things and trying things that he then doesn't do follow through on or changes. I mean, to take a non-political thing, he did that weird thing where links were stripped of any textual information from their title. And you're like, what the hell? Then he went back to putting the text in there because that was stupid. But to his credit, you know, it's a lot more transparent, if not 100% transparent, uh, as to what gets you in trouble. And obviously, there's some things that people might prefer not to get you in trouble at all that they get you in trouble, but it's a lot less, fewer things than it used to be. And the consequences are some people still get banned, and that's not ideal. They really need to move to a situation where they explain that or do you know, temporary bans or something, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Well, I think the thing that's impressing me the most about Musk is, you know, we can talk about Twitter. The, the fact that he gets taken to task for, um, you know, oh, you're allowing neo-Nazis. You know, it's like, oh, I saw one tweet the other day. Um, where I think Musk was talking about the great replacement. He was commenting on, is this okay? And someone retweeted it and said, you would have only read about this on Stormfront in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. And my question, what? Or in 2022. Yeah. And my question was, okay, now why? Why is that all out in the open? Why is it making its way out into the open? Why are people, why are people not so scared to ask those questions, to bring these things up anymore where, yeah, you know, 10 years ago, it was, you were relegated to a, a website that, that kept getting taken down every day. Well, I think part of it on that narrow, relatively narrow issue, though obviously important issue, a large part of it is indeed Twitter or, or X. Uh, a large part of it is, however, the fact that the, and these things, it's hard to tease out the different threads. A large part of it is that the problem, both in America and in the West in general, is much more prominent uh, both the problem of just the simple problem of mass of alien migrants, as well as the bad behavior that they get up to. I mean, Trump started this with his, they're not sending their best and his completely accurate complaint, they're sending rapists and, and so on. And so those two things go go together. Uh, and ultimately, and this is an overused phrase, but you get a little bit of a preference cascade. That is, you do it because other people do it and no one's stopping you, so more people do it. Uh, I, I I don't know how to boil this down to a tweet, so I haven't I haven't pointed it out. But it's uh, it's no doubt true that the um, what was I going to? Uh, yeah, I, I had this insightful thought, and it completely slipped my mind. I think it's uh, it's Alzheimer's, but um, I'll come it'll come back to me anyway. Go ahead. Um, well, uh, another thing that I noticed was he would get oh he has to go meet with the ADL oh he has to go to Auschwitz. And everybody's like, oh, see, he's kissing the ring. You know, he's kissing the wall, that that kind of thing. But then as soon as he comes back, he'll do something that will be controversial. That will, it, it's almost like he's he'll put out a tweet that'll be, or he'll retweet something that pushes back against what just happened to him. It's almost, I mean, I, I, that's again, too, it's almost like he's sending a signal. Yeah, almost, I mean, you know, I, I interpret it more as Musk is a work in progress. But when you have that kind of FU money and you know they, they stole $55 billion from him last week, that's a powerful incentive to F some people up, right? <laughs> I, you know, you and I, yeah, if $55 billion got stolen from us, we'd be pretty unhappy too. You know, five grand got stolen from us, we'd, we'd be unhappy. And if you're that kind of guy and you're not used to people and you have a little touch of the tism, as my children say, and you're, you, someone steals $55 billion from you, you know, you may not, uh, you may confine your public statements to talk about reincorporation, but what you're really thinking is the kind of stuff that gets you banned on your own site. So, you know, we'll see where that goes, is my point. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the reasons why uh, we decided to to do this, to talk about this, was, um, you know, you're constantly looking for friend or foe. You know, you're trying to figure out who's a friend or who's a foe. Um, if something that somebody's doing is actually 
advancing the call, co- you know, the cause of basically ending, ending the hell that, that this regime is. Mm-hmm. And I guess w- with you and I, we just went back. You, you said something about Rufo, um, you know, like basically being responsible for what happened at Harvard. Uh, that may be a little more Bill Ackman than, than Chris Rufo, but um, it's, I look at somebody, my problem is I'm looking at somebody who uses, who champions the civil rights act and uses the language of the regime. And I have a hard time believing that that person's on my side. Sure. They can do some things, that um, could maybe open some people's eyes or things like that, or he could be useful to um, any counter elites that are coming that are coming in. But um, it's hard for me for I mean I, I've heard him say things that just absolutely were insulting that mm-hmm. they just insulted my intelligence, insulted my sense of uh, my sense of digni- of human dignity, and. You know, so I, I guess I just have a hard. You, you know, you're you're the one who's talking about no enemies, no enemies on the right, and everything. And I look and I'm like, I don't see him over. There. I don't see him over there. <laughs> well, right. I mean, I, so I have no personal connection with Rufo. I mean, I did review his book and I've spoken to him a couple of times and so on. I we did a Twitter Spaces when one of the people uh, I was in and on the Twitter Spaces that he was running and so on uh, several months back. And so, but my opinion about Rufo is is actually if I had to pretty much diametrically opposite, which is I would place Rufo squarely on the right. And I, the, now, I don't know which specific things you're saying about insulting your intelligence. So you, maybe if you give me specific examples, but I read his well, book. He was, well, I mean, he, Oren had him on a few months ago and he, you know, Oren started talking about the Civil Rights Act and how we needed to get rid of it. And Rufo named like two people in the last like 40 years who were like on the far, far left mm-hmm. and said, yeah, and these two, these people on the far, far left, they want to get rid of the civil, they wanted to get rid of the Civil Rights Act. So it seems to be a far left thing, you know, trying to say that basically if you, yeah, and, 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 and of course, and Oren, you know, of course, Oren being Oren was just like, um, like I'm not going to sit here and and listen to this, you know, and, and immediately went back at him. But I mean, but, like, um, think about it, just step it back for a second. Like Rufo's obviously not a stupid guy. So yeah. you know, the fact that he comes up with things like that, it, I'm very skeptical generally of esoteric explanations. That is, person says X, but what he really means is Y, and he's signaling that through Z. Almost always those things are, are false. Not 100%, but even like a Machiavelli reading, you know, things like that are, are, are largely not true in terms of esoteric readings, in, in my opinion. But I do think you know, Rufo has an interesting, he has a unique position in in this case. And reading his book, it seems very esoteric. It's like reading a Michael Anton book. He, you can tell that he doesn't exactly think what he says, that what he thinks is probably more right wing than he's putting out. But because of various various incentives and desires to accomplish certain goals, uh, he doesn't do that. And so, well, I, I wasn't didn't watch that particular Oron thing. I think my read of that, having also read the book, is it's more likely that Rufo doesn't understands that the Civil Rights Act is part of the problem and is a leftist derived thing. But he regards that as detrimental to his to his immediate project, which is whipping people up against these, what we all know are actually simply natural extensions and manifestations of the civil rights regime, but can be cast as something that can be extended and cut off. Uh, Now, that may be false. I haven't asked Rufo about that. He hasn't said that. So I just made that up for what it's worth. But that strikes me as more likely, given the, the sum of the information we have, than that he's really just a one of these characters who are, of course, ubiquitous, who like James Lindsay. And of course, you know, James Lindsay is you know, always saying mean things. To uh, me. I'll take I'll take Chris Roof over James Lindsay. Right. So, I mean, Lindsay, Lindsay just basically loves himself some 1995 Civil Rights Act. I, I think Rufo is much more intellectually honest, but I don't think he's 100 percent intellectually honest in terms of his public statements. But I made that up. It's not like he told me that behind you know, behind closed doors or something. That's just my opinion. Well, while we're doing this, let, let me uh, throw another name out there. Um, I don't know how closely you followed the debates or 
if you've ever actually seen any interviews with Vivek Ramaswamy. But what, what what's your thoughts on him? Right. Well, it's, uh, I learned the other day it's Vivek. He, apparently, Vivek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vivek. Say it like cake. Uh, so, uh, well, it's funny. Uh, he came to town, town meaning Indianapolis, a uh, year and a half ago. There's like a local group that brings speakers. And my, my wife is like, do you want to go to this? I'm like, hell no. Looks boring. Who is that guy? So never going to hear about him again. <laughs> so, so I should have gone to the speech and gotten like a nice picture with, with Vivek. But uh, I actually am. And again, this puts me in someone of a minority in, in in our circles. The I, I'm a big fan of Vivek, and yes, I know he's Indian, Hindu, and he's not. You know, he, 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 there are these kind of things that don't make him fit right in. But I, I think it's foolish to discount allies of the intellectual and, more importantly, the nimble character that he has, uh, in order to. Uh, in order to make some kind of statement about how, well, this isn't the kind of guy we want. And so back to your point you made earlier, like the great replacement, right, is entirely bizarre that a, to people like us, that just a few years ago, uttering the words great replacement was enough to get you thrown out. Vivek was really the one who made that thing in the past six months mainstream. It, it, because he kept hammering it on on X. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't it, Trump. It wasn't it, some particular news event. It was basically Vivek who brought that into the public consciousness. Musk took it up. Some other people took it up. And yeah, played into the current events with with all the migrant invasion and so on. But the fact is that he, he needs to get a lot of credit for bringing these things into the mainstream. It's entirely bizarre to think that a Republican presidential candidate says half the things that Vivek did. And Vivek was the only person doing it. I mean, for decades, decades, you and I were put forced to do things like watch Bob Dole being being made the Republican presidential nominee. And that's what we would have gotten this time if it weren't for Trump and Vivek. And if it weren't for... Vivek, so far the Republican season would have been a bunch of stuff. This DeSantis, whatever DeSantis had his brain temporarily colonized or something by consultants, and uh, the the whole season would have been nothing but Tim Scott and Nikki Haley saying the same things that Bob Dole said. It would have been like the gayest thing ever. And so Vivek was the one who made all the joy and fun that we've had over the past six months possible. Does that mean that it's going to be? make a permanent change? Not necessarily, but it's better than it could have been. Well, I was talking to um, the other day to my friend, Matt Erickson. I think you're going to actually talk to him later this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he mentioned that. Um, and he told me, he said, um, go listen to Vivek, because I, I just had this thing. I, I've had this thing. I'm like, I look at Britain. I look at London. I look at Scotland. I look at Ireland, and I'm like, "Are we getting pushed? You know, another POC is getting pushed upon us, and everything yeah. like that." And he told me he, my friend Matt said, he was on Sean Ryan's podcast five five months ago. Go listen to it. And I listened to the first half hour of it, and I'm like, "Oh, he's interviewing Curtis Yarvin. <laughs> he sounds like a near reactionary." He's talking about he's talking about the managerial state. He's talking about how, how everything works. He's talking about that the only way to to fix this is to destroy it. Yeah. And I, and you know so you know as Matt was saying when he gets up on a debate stage he's throwing bombs you know like you know like Trump you know like like some insane boomer. But when you go and you really look and you see okay what does this guy really believe? Well, I mean he sounds like a neo reactionary, and yeah. that was that was shocking to me. That's kind of my feeling. I haven't heard that podcast, but I think that what we're seeing is the uh, these people who are um, who are making these statements are almost certainly more right wing than they let on. And you see that. And I think we touched on this before we started recording that there's a lot of people in the tech space, for example, who that's probably true of as well. And you see this all the time that, that people will change their mind but they wait until it's the right moment. And so everything that helps prepare the ground for this is advantageous. So, I mean, I, almost without a doubt, unless they, um, you know, kill him or something happens, Trump's going to get, you know, Trump's going to get the nomination. Sure. I mean, the, it, yeah. Um, 
do you what do you think about like a v uh, what what would a vp choice look like to you that would um signal that he's actually serious this time yeah well the problem is reading reading stuff from what trump does is such an uncertain science because most of what trump does is meaningless it's basically chaos and he, in particular that's true for the selection of individuals because his his judgment of character is so atrocious and his advisors are even more atrocious that what tends to come out he occasionally hires some good people but for the most part it's just it's always a disaster and so he's almost i think it's very high chance that he's going to pick someone who's who's terrible what he should do is pick someone like vivek or tucker carlson or something who is he, he will be able to take this message to the people who are receptive to it, which is the majority of Americans. I mean, by this message, I don't mean neo-reaction or talk about James Burnham and the managerial state. Uh, I mean a message of optimistic American hope for Americans once the regime is destroyed, which is fundamentally the message that, I mean, they, they focus less on that latter thing and more on those former thing as they should. But the fact is that we all know that we don't get the former thing unless we, we first do the latter thing, which is destroy the regime. Trump will never destroy the regime simply because he lacks discipline. I and mean, he may destroy the regime because the regime destroys itself in an attempt to destroy him. But Trump isn't going to actually clean the swamp. We, we all know this. But uh, as we all know, actuarially, the chances are pretty good that the vice president that Trump picks will, be, will become president. And so uh, what I hope is that he'll pick someone who would be good for that position. I think it's a very good chance that he'll pick someone completely atrocious. So no JD Vance or anybody like that. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be all for J, JD Vance would also be uh, be be fine by me. I mean, there's a relatively short list, but the short list that the consultant class comes up with is the short list that everybody knows is loathsome. You know, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, uh, Chris Christie. I mean, I know he's, I know he's not going to pick Chris Christie, but you know, people like that. Uh, it's uh, that governor of North Dakota, Noam. No, Noam. yeah, yeah Christie. You know, I mean, she, she of course you know, is permanently disqualified because she vetoed the the uh, anti you know, child mutilation bill, and so the you know, she's. We all know that she's no better than Chris Christie. If he picks, but Trump would. You could easily see Trump picking someone like that. Yeah. Do you think that in the last four years, the the Democrats and the regime have gotten weaker or have gotten stronger? Much weaker. Why do you what what evidence do you point to? Well, certainly the the their figurehead and technically regime includes <laughs> includes uh, the West as a whole, excluding Hungary, now they've managed to capture at least temporarily Poland. Of course, the regime is headquartered in, in the United States. So the regime's figurehead is, and figureheads matter because figureheads are the basis through which you you uh, use top level power, obviously not the only avenue for power, but having a clown as a figurehead is actually extremely debilitating. And then when you surround that clown with more clowns, it really produces a, a very debilitating effect. It's not just that you're a laughing stock; it's that you're unable to actually execute anything. And you see this also in things like the the this this immigration bill. The the, the ability of these people to control the process is just much less than it used to be. I mean, part of that is is X and so on, but the the the, the complete inability to execute on plans in any coherent way. You know, their inability to uh, to keep funneling money for the war in Ukraine, their, their inability to uh, the whole Texas border thing, their, their kind of brain infarction when Abbott gave them the finger, instead of doing one thing or the other thing, they did the only thing they could think of, which is ignore it. But that's still something that a couple of years ago would have been unthinkable for the regime to do, to simply ignore it and hope it, it goes away. It might have, in fact, been their best choice at the at the time, but it's something that would have been inconceivable. Um, it's like Princess Bride. I'm misusing that word or whatever that, that line from Princess Bride is. I, I don't think that word means what you think. But so much of what we see today is inconceivable if you looked at Pete and Charles of 2021, much less 2019 or 2018, much less 2014, which wasn't that long ago. So I, I think that 
it's hard to see, you know, the counter response might be, well, the regime is still in charge. Well, of course, I mean, the regime, this is my point about fragility, which I'm always making, which is fragility doesn't mean that you lack power. Fragility means that at a crisis, you're unable to keep it together. And right now, there's no actual crisis, but certainly the tea leaves suggest that the regime is. In the, with the thought in mind of the regime becoming weaker, and that's what we need, um, do you think that it, do you see it as a positive that, you know, no matter what you think about the election in 2020, do you see it as a positive that Trump actually lost? That's actually a great question. Um, all your questions are great, but it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, you know, as Lenin said, he who says A must say B. So, if, if, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think that's right. I mean, if, if, what what Beatles song was that? Uh, no, as Lenin said. Uh oh. Oh, no. <laughs> not John, not John Lennon. You know, <laughs> Vladimir Lennon. Different. Oh, okay, that guy. You are a spiritual boomer, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I've I've read I've I've read Lennon's State and Revolution, the whole book on my podcast. I'm very familiar oh, with yes, who Lennon yeah. is. <laughs> You're so prolific. I can't keep up with that, with everything you you uh, you do. Um, but I, I think you're right that if Trump had had actually uh, been able to take office in 2020, probably things would be, the regime would be in a better position because they would have had a, an object of hate to revolve around, but wouldn't have felt it necessary to to go quite all the way that they will when he wins again in, uh, in November, which of course is my thesis. Is a Trump win, is that a benefit to the left because it becomes a pressure release valve for Trump's people? Um, no, because the, I mean, if Trump wins, the, the left is certain to engage in extremely large scale violence. Uh, and it, even though if you sat down, the smarter people on the left, they would say, this is a bad idea. But it, just historically, this is just the way that since the left has no internal limiting function and the most radical people tend to, particularly in pressure cooker situations, the decision making tends to default to them, both from a combination of ideology and because those people are the most willing to uh, to threaten other people. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that that's just... Uh, the way it's inevitably going to be, regardless of what objectively might be a more a better tactical course. Let me ask you about this. Um, I'm sure that you know you know that the, this conversation and this bet going back and forth between Orin and AA um, is the woke going to get put away? No. What I, do you think? Well, to be fair to AA, his definition of that is somewhat narrower than then is is not really the same thing as the left losing or the left rolling back its gains he means a he i believe he means more of a superficial uh putting away but he for the same reason essentially the same analysis i just gave the left cannot actually roll back even on a superficial level what it perceives to be its gains even when that makes tactical sense yes you can make the case that objectively this would make sense. You should consolidate, and you would, you know, come up with some cheesy quote from Sun Tzu about how one should consolidate one's gains and wait for, you know, whatever. They're just incapable of doing that because there's no example in history of them ever doing that. It's just the way it goes. They're, they're, they just can't do it, and it, it doesn't matter that Bill Ackman is upset at at Harvard. Bill Ackman, you know, the the. the Bill Ackman has other reasons for being upset at Harvard, and the, the, you know, the, the, that gets into the whole October 7th and the, the Jewish-Palestinian conflict. But that's not a sign of the woke being put away. It is a sign of cracks in the left coalition. But Bill Ackman is just as leftist as he used to be and is eager to, to advance every single leftist cause except for uh, the ones that affect him and the things he cares about personally. So that, that's not an example of the woke being being put away. And the appearance of a few newspaper articles and the fact that there's a few, uh, a slightly higher percentage of white people on TV is not the woke being put away. Yeah. Um, 
the, th the thing about um, well, the, the one thing I want I guess I wanted to ask had to do with um, if there is a concerted effort, a maybe even a cabal of elites right now who are plotting to um, to take over. Um, the fact is, is especially if they're like tech bros, like we were talking about, mm -hmm. there's going to be leftism built into that anyway. I mean, they're right. not going these. They may agree with us on a, you know, it's like RFK Jr. It's like, uh, yeah, the guy's right on the pharmaceutical complex, but we you know, sure. and, and Ukraine terrible on Israel, um, helpful in some ways, but if, I mean, <laughs> the way I look at it is there's ba basically right now, if any kind of improvements were going to be made, and I think people like Bukele prove that things can be, things can improve. Sure. People, you know, people who are so black pilled to be like, you know, it's always, it's always going to be bad. No, I mean, we've seen, look, look at Russia compared to the nineties. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're doing a lot better. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't mind if a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these tech bros, even though they have they have leftist tendencies and a lot of things, if they're going to, you know, run this like a business and run it like a, um, run it like a corporation, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'd rather have them in charge right now than the, um, you know, what's in charge right now. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of people who are in the elites who are considering their options. I don't think that means that they're preparing to form a new elite or, or or anything like that. I just think it's everybody is realizing that people have been saying for years that Francis Fukuyama was wrong. History is not over. But now people are really beginning to understand that not only is history not over, history is coming to bite us in the ass. And so I think there's a lot of rich and powerful people who are like, when I grew up, I thought that we would have, you know, it's the famous teal thing. I was promised flying cars and I got 140 characters. So not only am I not going to get uh, 140, uh, not going to get flying cars, I'm going to get pandemics and wars. And this was not the uh, the future I was promised. So I need to consider how, how this is going to affect me for the rest of my life and allow me not to be some guy who's uh, becomes like a refugee or something like that. So I don't think there's a cabal of people who are trying to overthrow the regime. I think there's a lot of people who are considering what and educating themselves on the basis of history, given that the future looks like it's going to be a lot jankier than they hoped. I think that what that necessarily means, though, is that once the regime crumbles, which it's you know, certain to probably in the near future, because that's the nature of, of fragile things, you get basically a free-for-all. And Yes, it's true that if you took like a group of current elites who reconsider their positions and come up with new positions and insert them as the new elite, you would get a lot of leftism because that's baked into their intellectual cake. Uh, I don't think it's safe to assume that on the other side of the regime crumbling, you would get the same thing. Because you, if you if you already dropped 40% of your leftism, you can also drop the other 60%. And you can look at like Bukele or whatever, and you can say, or you can get a, a preference cascade or a religious reawakening where it simply becomes all those those old style you know, theories, depending on how bad the crisis is that ends the regime, get thrown out because people are like, that stuff didn't work at all. So we need something totally new. We're going to go. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have to be neo reaction. It could be any number of things. But the fact the idea that leftism is going to continue on because leftism is, has been the basis for these people's worldview so far is probably not a safe one. Do you think that anybody is going to look at um, Millet in Argentina and get any inspiration from what he's doing down there? I haven't been really been following it. I mean, he seems to be following through on some of his procedural things and employment and so on. Uh, I, I, I just don't know enough about politics on there to say whether that's actually being effectual, what the possible ways to push back are. I mean, talk's a big game, and that's amusing. I think Bukele is a much more uh, interesting uh, example because the things he he had a very specific set of problems, and he was able to implement a very specific set of solutions. And Millet seems to have be more. Again, I don't know much about it, but he seems to be uh, heavily 
focused by the idea that I am a libertarian and these are the things that will make it better. It was Bukele, I think, came at it in the way that I would prefer to look at it, which is organic. That is, society in El Salvador sucks. How can it be fixed? Well, this is the way. And while it's also obvious, for example, from that flows from that, that these losers who allowed this to happen, their worldview sucks. So we're going to tear down all their statues and melt them into sewer covers. That doesn't flow from some underlying ideology. It flows from a realization that the people in charge or anti-reality and evil. And now we're going to look at the way we should really run this society rather than saying, how does this fit into the different books that I've studied in the past? That may be unfair to Millet, but you get that kind of flavor that he's over-intellectualizing it. Because what's needed is action, not intellectual action. Yeah, it's it definitely seems like Bukele was like, okay, what is the biggest problem I face and how do I solve it? And he... Uh, he wasn't coming at it ideologically. You know, it's like Sam Francis, uh, Sam Francis wrote when he was reviewing James Burnham's suicide of the West, he said that the you know, ideology is conceived in a vacuum mm -hmm. and it, it never exists in reality because once it gets introduced to, into reality, what it was conceived as, you know, meets, you know, it's like Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And I, I think that's what what's funny is, he, you know, he calls himself, Malay calls himself an anarcho-capitalist. And as somebody who used to call himself an anarcho-capitalist, <laughs> um, I'm, you know, one of the things anarcho-capitalists frown upon is using the using state power. Mm -hmm. So he passes, he gets his bill passed through, and I don't know how he got passed because he didn't have the numbers, but he got a bill passed where he cut out, cut all the privatized a bunch of things, cut a bunch of regulations, did all this. And then um, people poured out into the streets to protest. And then he unleashed the cops on him. He, unle yeah. he unleashed the forces on him. And I'm and I'm thinking to myself, oh, that's exactly what I would do. I mean, and I mean, I would be like Bukele. It's like, OK, you're going to jail and I don't know. You may never get out again. But it's totally against his ideology. So it was funny for it's funny for me to watch because I've always said, you know, once you can have all the ideology in the world, but once it gets introduced to reality, you're going to have to do things that are outside of the box. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And I think Bukele seems not not that much about him either. I think Bukele obviously faces other problems. I mean, for example, the traditional solution for all those people wouldn't be to jail them. It would be to take care of them permanently and not taking care of them permanently is a huge risk, or at least if a significant fraction of the people who are who are who are the real ringleaders or troublemakers or anybody above the rank of private, effectually, it really, you, you should take an alternate path for those people, because otherwise they're still sitting in your prisons. There's prison breaks, yada, yada, yada. And there's nothing, nothing like figuring out what to do ahead of time to solve yourself problems later. So we'll see. It's early days yet. But I think that kind of non-ideological approach is correct. And I always use my standard definition of ideology is, is Burnham's, which is basically, I forget the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of a set, a set of thought which no outside fact can change the structure of the thought that's already been set up. So in other words, an outside thought is incorporated into the structure if it contradicts it rather than than changing the the believer's mind. Yeah. Well, the whole thing with Bukele and you were mentioning putting them in prison, um, you know, even one person got off at Devil's Island eventually. But yeah, the fact is, is that he could be overthrown at any time. And if it's anything like the regime we have here, which it probably would be, it would probably be the same spirit of the regime we have here. They'll just release them all. Right. And that's they'll, they'll, that's they'll release them. Yeah. I mean, they love, you know, people forget how much they love chaos in other countries. I mean, Gaddafi has order in his country. Everything's fine. Oh, let's kill him. Oh, I mean, just basically over overthrowing all these secular leaders all over the world and replacing them with religious, you know, with religious, uh, you know, monsters. And then, you know, hey, oh, why is everything so bad over there? No, why did you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's certainly the desire in America, though, and there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, the the problems that are created by the regime are concentrated in the areas most tightly controlled by the regime, which is really not a great structure. You, you need to have, if they, if they had any sense, they would they would try to cause crime problems 
by spreading your MS-13 types outside of the cities. But for a variety of structural reasons, that's that's largely impossible in America. Uh, and the MS-13 people are using them as a stand-in for, for violent migrants. They want to live in the cities. They don't want to go out to the sticks. And they know perfectly well that if they go out to the sticks, they're going to get shot. And so, so that's one of the things that makes it different in America, makes it impossible. It's same thing with the Floyd riots. I'm always talking about this, but the Floyd riots all took place only in places where the government was 100% controlled, police, prosecutors, et cetera, by the left wing. It didn't take place anywhere else. And, and there's, there's really no way for the left to, to get away from that. Um, historically, in things like the Spanish Civil War, and I know you've, you've talked to a lot about these things, but you, you see the left using riots and street violence in cities. But historically, cities have typically had both a left and a right wing presence. Now we only have cities with a left wing presence. So, so it's kind of stupid. I mean, left wing and fellow travelers like Chicago, right? You have the whole city is dominated by left wing people. And then you have left wing enablers in all the suburbs who can't be heard, who can't be heard to complain in the next go round when their houses are burned because that's justice. But it, it, that that's historically anomalous. Normally you have a much larger segment of right wing people in urban centers and in, and right around and nowadays the, the so it's interesting to to wonder how that will play out in the next round of of American violence. Well, that's an interesting conversation right there that I've seen people have is um you know I tell people get the hell out of cities. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I get out of cities. I'm as far out of a city as possible. And you know as you could possibly well, not as I mean it could be a lot I could be a lot further out, but you know I'm sufficiently out. Um, but a lot of people will argue that, well, the power centers are the cities. If everyone on the right abandons the cities, then the left controls the cities and they have and you know, they seem to be making an argument for right wing people either staying in or moving to to the cities to try and take it back. What's your opinion on that? But I'd have to get an actual person rather than you know, who can can steel man the argument. But it seems stupid to me, honestly. I mean, I lived in Chicago for 13 years, um, all through the 90s and into the 2000s. I loved Chicago. I mean, it was different in Chicago. But the fact is that even then, right wing people had no presence whatsoever unless you define willing to vote for Bob Dole in 1996 as as right wing which a few few people so they had no presence in a political structure they had no presence in the elites they had no presence anywhere period and if you were to the right of bob dole even back then you were persona non grata and there may be some cities where there's variations on that like dallas for example so there's probably a few cities where that's not strictly speaking true but all the urban hyper centers in America are exactly like that. And all of the smaller urban centers are largely like that and getting more so over the past couple of years. So a right wing person moving to the cities, I, I don't see what that could possibly accomplish for that person personally or for, for the right wing movement uh, a, as a whole. I mean, as we all know, you have two choices. You move to the city, so you have a bunch of kids your kids will all get transed or whatever, and it, unless you in, insulate them, and that was a waste of your time. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't see any benefit to moving to the cities. And you see, you do see people who who complain that there's the right wing needs to work on capturing the elites and so on, but that's kind of a Pollyanna project, which is not really feasible in any meaningful way. Yeah, that doesn't really happen. That's not that's something that has to happen organically and happen from. Uh... I mean, you can look around for people, like say in a small town or something, if you wanted to, you know, if you didn't like the direction it was going in and you wanted to try and change it and get some people elected, um, you'd look for like natural elites possibly to be the ones who would run, uh, you'd want to run because people would have more respect for them, um, spe you know, especially if they're on the right. And most of the time in a small town, it's gonna, they're going to be on the right. Um, but yeah, I mean, just trying to manufacture elites out of thin air is just, uh, or or to um, persuade elites. I consider you to be elite, Charles. Ah. But, you know, so let me, um, I, I, here's what I'm going to need you to do. Okay. <laughs> to hear it. <laughs> I mean, it just that just doesn't work. I mean, you'd have to have the will to do. You'd have to have the will and, and to do. Small it. town is a good point. That is, in a small town, it, historically, I think this has probably changed somewhat. But 
you could have elites with widely diff differing political views, the more likely they would be right wing. Because if you, you, the elites in a small town really shouldn't be spending all their time to the extent of interacting with each other, talking about politics, they should be talking about how to, how to make the town a better place. You know, should we you know, do something with the railroad or how about the bridge or, you know, well, how about the sewer system? You know, the, the, people used to understand that life wasn't meant to be hugely politicized. And so therefore elites could, could differ. Now, admittedly, there was less ideological separation simply it, it just in America as a whole between the wings of, of right and left wing. So maybe that's a bit of a, you know, looking back on history with a rose colored glasses. But I, I do think that a small town historically, it was easier for people not to have political divisions because politics wasn't the sum of all things. Right. Right. Yeah. It's when you, when I talk to people around here, it's really culture more uh, than politics. And, yeah. um, and we're not talking about political culture. We're talking about just the culture of how, you know, has there been any crime lately? Is there mm -hmm. things like that? I mean, I mean, I guess you can make that political if you want, but uh, it's not specifically political. It's more um, like building, you know, worrying about where where the culture and where the um, the cohesion of mm -hmm. the um, of the unit is. Um, yeah, I know that we've talked before that you think that going towards the future that um, there's going to be violence and that you'll you'll eventually see things start breaking breaking up um how decentralized does it get when you have like a you know like just like take georgia for existence i mean once you get outside of atlanta basically you're in the you're you're in a predominantly red area you're every, everything's hyper red everything's hyper religious um i mean how does that work does it get so decentralized that the you know, Atlanta will just, you, you'd almost have to break the state up. Atlanta would become an autonomous zone. Well, it, it, it's hard to say. The, the historical method of solution for this is migration, you know, people exchange. Um, but it's anomalous, as I say, that the cities are so adversarial to the non-city areas of the country. Obviously, the rural urban divide has always been a thing for a variety of reasons. But that's a divide, and that divide has been very contentious at times, particularly when the, you know, the rural people felt that they weren't getting enough to eat, or even like extremely contentious, like in 1930s Soviet Union, where they starve the rural people for a combination of need for bread and for ideological reasons. But historically, the kind of political hatred between the cities and the rural areas were not nearly as significant because, as I said earlier, the, the cities were not monolithically political one way or the other. They might have had different interests, and certainly the people within them might have been politically at odds. But you, you could imagine a situation where this, a city, the people who were, say, the leading lights of a city on one side of political issue, if that state were to become autonomous, like Georgia, which has one big city, you can imagine those leading lights on one say, well, you know, it's time for me to move. I'm going to go someplace that's more congenial for me. But that wouldn't really affect the city as a whole in any meaningful way. Now, basically, you have to get rid of two sets of people in the city. You have to get rid of the left-wing elites and the parasitical underclass. And you're left with like five people. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's not really fair to the underclass. There's large sections. Of, well, the underclass and the you know working lower class are really separate things. I mean, it, you can break it down different ways. But the underclass, say, in a city like Chicago is 20 to 30 percent. Uh, you have a, a working class set of people who mostly exist to serve uh, people who don't provide any value at all, which is the upper, you know, Gaetano Mosca's governing elite. So in Chicago, you might have 20 percent of people who are all left wing and the governing elite, 98 percent of whom produce no social value at all. That is, their jobs are worthless. They don't do anything. And in this scenario, they have to leave if they want to go make a living. Well, that means that the, the classes that serve them have no purpose, right? They can't be paid because those people aren't getting fake money anymore to pay them. There's nothing for them to do in the city. And then the underclass just you know, relies on gibs and handouts. And you know, so there's basically nothing left in that scenario for a, for a city. So the, they would, the only way it would work is if large segments of the city move to a new state or country that was more congenial to whatever to the more traditional structure. I don't think that would work out well in the in the long term for a variety of reasons. But just using Georgia as the example and thinking about it out loud, 
yeah, I mean, Atlanta would basically have to be hollowed out and you yeah. know, ignore it. And most it'd be like the outer rings of Tokyo, which have been you know falling into the earth because no one lives there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's rather interesting that the, um, that when you take into consideration that it does, I'm just almost convinced that it's going to come to fracturing at some point. It, it, it just, Probably. It, it just has to, um, that, that's also going to probably come with some level of violence too. Sure. I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, I, I, it's like the old joke I'm always quoting. I I don't know who originally, but yeah, these things aren't to be desired because everyone imagines that when the revolution comes, their position won't change at all. And the revolution will happen around them. (laughs) That's not the way it works. I mean, and normally your position is not improved by revolutions, even if you're not a participant in the revolution or fracture or uh, whatever, whatever term you're picking for societal or social unrest, it's not beneficial for most people in the short term. Uh, The only upside is that in the long term, it can be, but it's not necessarily good for the society as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Do you see that if there is fracturing that people could have different, like, I mean, you, um, I don't even know if we've ever talked about foundationalism. You're, you know, what you talk about, we've actually discussed it, but um, I think it makes enough sense because, I mean, there's a lot of people I know who would like to have like, um, you know, Prussian national socialism in their area. (laughs) And there are people who would like to have, and it just seems to me that I do believe that people need to be led and people need to be told what to do. And, and, And in a lot of cases, people need to be told what to believe because they're just, because people are they're. I don't even know if they're stupid. I think they just don't pay attention enough. They haven't, they're busy with their lives doing whatever, and they need to be told what to believe. But I also tend to believe that it's whatever is coming next is going to have to have some kind of echoes of what we have now. I mean, clearly, or at least if it's different, if it's, it always does. I mean, but I think people do need to be told what to believe, but the actual answer I think is that, People shouldn't need, feel they need to believe anything about politics for the most part. Most people should just, they don't have to be told what to believe about politics. They just should believe nothing about politics other than that, you know, the, the assuming the national government or the, the government above the local level is run pretty well and doesn't, and doesn't you know, overtax them, extort them, kill them. You know, pretty much they should have nothing whatsoever to say or think about it as long as things are, are, are running pretty well. So you don't have to convince people to adopt anarcho-capitalism or whatever political belief the government has. You just, they don't have to have any beliefs about the government. That's it. I mean, you, you, you just provide an adequate framework for the people to lead flourishing lives and they don't have to tell them what to believe at all. I mean, they don't have to, then they, they don't believe anything. I mean, they believe that whatever religion they believe, I mean, that, it used to be that every society was run this way. People didn't have opinions about politics or ideologies or whether Prussian national socialism was good or bad, because where's Prussia? I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's somewhere else that's not applicable to an American living in anywhere. I mean, yes, to an academic maybe, but to your average person shouldn't have any opinion of, at all about anarcho capitalism or or Prussian national socialism or communism. It just is, unless they have some historical interest or academic interest, it just shouldn't matter to most people. Ideology should simply not be a component of most people's lives. Is it as simple as, I mean, if you're going to have leaders and you're going to have people who rule over you, that for them just to not hate you? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's certainly better than we have now, but historically, the, the rulers who regarded as best cared deeply about the people, not about what the people thought. They didn't give a rat's ass what the people thought. What they thought, you know, I mean, the classic example of this is Charlemagne, who regarded himself as responsible to God for the souls of every one of his every one of his subjects. You know, a, a, a heavy burden, and that doesn't mean that Charlemagne was a nice guy, but you know, he did his best. And this was traditional throughout most European monarchies to to have the 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 society as a whole be well governed. When we get our our image of the history of the West, whether medieval or 
even later or earlier from movies, all of which are lies. There's you know, the, this idea that somehow the leader, that it was a life was what in the, in a Hobbesian words, nasty, brutish and short, and that the, all the leaders were just extractive or you get like insane myths like prima nocte and things like that. You know, I mean, the, the fact is that it, it, historically most governments uh, cared what the people thought both because they were responsible to God and you know, the Hans Hermann Hoppe argument that a monarch is better because he maximizes the long-term value of his of his kingdom. I mean, I think you can make that too economic, but there's truth there that it, a, a well-run monarchy, and I don't think monarchy is necessarily the best form of government, though it, it's certainly appropriate in many instances, a well-run monarch makes sure that everyone is doing well, because if they're doing well, he's doing well. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just obvious if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me that you would, that leaders would get their people to the point where their people hate them so much that they would have to worry. You'd have to worry about the people. Yeah. It, it doesn't make any sense. It, I mean, it's so illogical when you think about modern politics where it's like the leaders I mean, I was reading this long thread um, by, uh, by by a Mizrahi Jew, and he was talking about Zionism, like what he what the IDF was doing, because it came out that there was a Telegram channel that was showing all of the war crimes, mm -hmm. and it turned out that the Telegram channel was run by the IDF. They were putting <laughs> these things out there, Why? and. Be, well, that that's what his his Twitter post was. His Twitter post was was saying that what they've done for so many decades now is they've sought to isolate themselves, mm -hmm. and by doing this and by showing what they're doing, they're this is seeking to isolate themselves even more by causing you know, Israeli citizens and Jews around the world to feel war to be be afraid you know that that's one of the things that they did to to help form um israel was they um fake fake bombings things oh fake anti-semitism attacks oh we really need israel you need to come here uh, they did that in certain spots um you know stern gang people like that um but it, it's he, what, what he's talking about is he's saying that they're they want to they're basically rallying the troops and the best way that they know to rally the troops is by making more people hate them. It's an interesting psychological approach. Uh, I mean, I think like, I don't uh, honestly spend a lot of mind space on the Israel thing. My, my, uh, my only opinion, I mean, I, and I kind of see the Israeli perspective. You have the, these, the small group of people who are threatened by all their, their neighbors, leaving aside, you know, the ins and outs of how they got there or whether they're legitimately there. But I just don't care that much. I mean, there's no American interest in the Middle East. Basically, all America, we shouldn't give any money to anybody and we, sh we shouldn't have any soldiers there at all. And I just, I mean, I, the, the amount of brain space spent on it is is excessive. And I understand why that is uh, on, on a couple of different levels. But most of the time, I, I just don't pay that much attention to it because I, I, my principle is that, you know, just don't give anybody any more money. And of course, this immigration bill, which the you know, laughably named National Security Act, I don't know what its official title is, uh, it, it, national security meaning funneling, well, three times the money to Ukraine that's going to even Israel, which, I mean, that's even strange. I mean, given the, the normal historical you know, political imperatives in America, you would think that the ratio would be reversed, more money for, for Israel than for, for Ukraine. So I don't know what's going on there. But I mean, none of this stuff should be happening. I mean, it, it's very simple. I, uh, the older I get, the more I, I think most political things can be made simple rather than complicated. All right, let's end like this. Um, <laughs> I know you read like 250 books a year, so recommend a book. Recommend a book. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, well, you, you mentioned one I would recommend, which is the I, and I, I'm uh, my apologies to Alex Kashuda because I didn't steal this from her. I just, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> the book that I would recommend is one that I've been reading, so it's a bit of a, a bit of a cheat. 
but uh, or I've have read and need to review. Uh, you know, Sean McMeekin is he wrote Stalin's War, yep. which is a kind of uh, I hate the term revisionist because it implies that somehow the you know, left wing historians who are being schooled are the default, and the revision is is somehow. Yeah. But so I mean, McMeekin is a somewhat revisionist historian. He wrote a good book on the Russian Revolution as well. But one of his earliest books, which he actually wrote when he was uh, teaching in Istanbul. Of all things, I don't know how he ended up teaching in Istanbul, but if you look at the, the fly cover, it's, it shows a picture of a young Sean McMeekin in Istanbul. But it's July 1914, which is uh, again a blow by blow account, kind of similar to, to the Gravediggers book, but much more detailed of July 1914, which is the month after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand of Sarajevo, running up to the actual uh, declaration of war in Europe in World War One, And it's fascinating because it, it tells a story that everybody kind of knows, but the, it you take various lessons away from it, among them the uh, they, that there are an infinite number of crises, very grave crises, not infinite number, but several grave crises in the years running up to World War One. that this crisis could easily have been as well. That is something that ultimately petered out and led to nothing. And it didn't, obviously, for a variety of reasons. But I think this is, you know, I'm a team happening guy. That is, I think that the, when people say nothing ever happens, they're falling into the same error as the people who in pre-World War I said, well, you know, the, the, the first Moroccan crisis ended with nothing. So nothing will, is ever going to happen. You know, that, you know, that's true until it's not. And so I think reading books like this, it's kind of a cliche that World War One, and we can all end up like World War One, yada yada. But seeing the actual mechanics of it in practice is actually very interesting. Awesome, all right. thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for the talk, and um, 